sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the people who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. So they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. I want to talk to you all from the thought this morning, you deserve better. You deserve better. If y'all would do me a favor, just open up your mouth underneath your mask and say, you deserve better. better. Amen. You can take your seats. You deserve better. Amen. So I'm coming out the jacket early because I got some teaching to do this morning. You're a blessing to my life. Thank you, son. Amen. You deserve better. Thought for the moment, the most consistent and committed people in our lives are the most neglected people in our life. Think about that for a moment. The most consistent and committed people in our lives are the most neglected people in our life. Years ago, I was able to buy my very first dream car, my very first dream car, one of many, amen, one of many. And I got the car, And it took me everywhere I wanted to go, everywhere I wanted to go. It was a wonderful car, wonderful driving car, wonderful automobile, never gave me any problems. And so whatever I wanted to do, wherever I wanted to go, I could just hop in the car and not have to worry about it starting up. Anybody ever had a car like that? You, Lord, you prayed before you got to the car? Lord, please let this car start. You know, uh, back when I was dating Lady Nicole, I had a 1984 Ford Mustang. When I would go visit her, I know she remembers it. I had to leave the car running. Because if I didn't leave the car running, there was no telling if the car was going to start. Amen. So I had to keep a full tank of gas. Jordan, that's where daddy gets it from. I didn't know. And so when the Lord blessed me to get cars, I could just not have to worry about starting. You know, I'm living the dream. Right. So for years and years and years, the car took me wherever I wanted to go, daughter. No concerns, no issues. But here, Mama Vern, lies the problem. I didn't change the oil. I didn't follow the manual. I didn't do what the people told me to do with the car. I heard a click. I'm like, it's going to be all right. I heard a pop. I said it was going to be all right. I took the things that were necessary for quality maintenance to ensure I always had a good ride. I'm a good man of God. Thank you. For granted. For granted. And over time, I did that, and the car began to neglect me. Sometimes the car started, sometimes the car kicked out white smoke, sometimes the check engine light would come on, and all types of problems happened because I took for granted that the way the car was when I got it, it was always going to be that way without me obeying the the needs of the car. Y'all see where I'm going. And so what happened is when the car starts doing what it doesn't want, what I wanted to do, I got mad at the car and started blaming the devil. Or I would get mad at God, God, you gave it to me why would you let this happen and I want somebody to understand it's not that God is the devil and it's not that the devil is at fault is that you have neglected your responsibility in the relationship here is the problem here is the problem God says you deserve better you deserve better but guess what so does God when we trace our history and we go back to Genesis those of you that don't realize this there were religions before Judaism there was religion before Christianity there was religion before Jesus came on the scene if we trace back and go to Abraham Abraham came out of a pagan nation he came out of a pagan nation of people and they had already had types of concepts catch it now about virgin births about a messiah about different things that we consider holy even unto this day. And they had multiplicities of God. With gods, which is important when you go and you read the Genesis narrative to understand, it's just not a colorful book. It's poetic, yes, but it's also giving insight to what was going on while Moses was writing the book. So the language that they were using was language that was needed for the time that they were in. Y'all, just I'm gonna paint the picture. I'm gonna teach today, not too much hollering. So what happens is you read Genesis and you 
you hear that God sets the tone that there will be no other God, that I am God, that I am Yahweh God, that I am Elohim. He's letting you know that I am the God with the name. This is important because you must understand Abraham came out of a generation of people that served pagan gods. They had gods for the sun, gods for the moon, gods for the earth, gods for the trees. They had different gods. So when Jehovah allows Moses to write the book, he's making it plain to every other nation around them. What separates me from you is that I'm one God and there's no other God but me. And so with the other gods, things were required in order to get their favor. Y'all hear where I'm going. So now they had to pray for the sun to shine. They had to pray for the rain to come. But if you go back to Genesis 1, you see God had already separated the expanses. He'd already created the land. He made vegetation come. He hung the sun. He caused darkness to go away. He's saying, I did all these things and it's not necessary for other gods. So now as we begin to fast forward through the book, he's painting a picture. He says, now I'm going to call out a group of people that will understand who I am. And I'm going to pour my love on them, separating them from everybody else. Because when they see who I am to this group of people, hopefully they will have a change of heart. So now when you go into Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and a lot of people like to quote this, how God talks about if the alien or the stranger wants to dwell among among you don't mistreat them but here is the thing God is saying if they see and they understand what's going on they must adhere to my guidelines and my principles so so now I'm just taking you walk through the Bible there are many gods God steps on the scene through Moses gives Moses the insight to write the book to tell the nations there's only one God and his name is Jehovah and this is where we get you will serve the Lord your God him and him alone God is saying you deserve better instead of praying to idols and dumb poles and trees and things that I have created you need to worship the creator and as long as you worship me you will remain in my favor you don't have to slice your wrist because in some of these religions they had to cut themselves you'll read in the book of Leviticus as well as in the book of Numbers uh, God told the children of Israel do not offer your children to Moloch Moloch was an idol God that the pagans around them they would get newborn babies and throw them into the fire they would chop them up they would kill them they would destroy them as a sacrifice to that God so that their land would be blessed but God pulled them out and said I don't want you to be like those nations he says if you would hearken diligently unto me then all these blessings will overtake you so Shay, here's what God is saying you don't have to do what the pagans do all you got to do do is listen to me because you deserve better in the midst of God saying you deserve better he says so do I but let me paint the picture he continues to walk through time we go through all the way from Exodus we go through the, the books of the law we get to the book of Joshua from Joshua we get to judges uh, what's important here that I want you guys to understand is that there was Joshua and there were the people that were still around during Joshua's time and after they had done all the conquering after Joshua came and did all the fighting he took them through a whole kind concept of the, the, the law again he says let heaven and earth testify that I have told you what is necessary to please God and if you please God his blessing will be upon your life now I want to push pause right here this is not in my lesson I want you all to hear me very clearly simply because you love God simply because you serve Jesus does not mean you will not have trials it's a lie I don't know what they told you but it's a lie right just because you serve him just because you love him just because you call on his name does not mean your life will be absent of struggle that really is contrary to the fact the difference is we have a God that we know sees our struggle that sent a savior to go through like temptations and trials like us that when we pray to God in his name we have an advocate through Christ Jesus who says father I understand what they're going through give them mercy somebody say I deserve better your boyfriend can't understand it your girlfriend can't understand it your husband and wife may kind of understand it but you have a God that understands he says you deserve 
better. And so now we get to Joshua and we head over to Judges. Joshua, Elder Brandon, is on his way out. This is important. This is important. This is very important. I want you all to hear where I'm going. Joshua's on his way out. We go to chapter 2. Joshua's still around. But the angel of the Lord appears. I want you all to always remember this because as you're going through Old Testament, you must find Jesus in the text. Now, you're not going to see Jesus named Jesus, but you're going to see appearances of the angel of the Lord, which is Jesus pre-incarnate, which means this is Christ before he took on flesh. Amen. So we have, they say, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, but it's still one God in the name of Jesus. So when you go to Judges 2, you see the angel of the Lord that's speaking as God. He says, now I brought you out of Egypt. I'm the God that's going to bless you. I'm the one that's going to keep you. And he's giving them all types of guidelines to follow. I want to push pause right here because I'm not going to teach a lesson that has anything to do with you trying to get to heaven by a checklist. But the love God means God still has standards and standards are a part of who God is. Any God that you serve that's absent of standards is not the real God. A lot of churches now are serving a God, but that God does not have standards. That God does not have expectations, but we can have expectations of that God while having no standards. Somebody say, I deserve better. Think about this. Why is it crazy to expect or deny the fact that God would want us to have standards for him and we have standards for each other? Why would God expect me to do this? But if you're in a relationship, you expect that person you're in a relationship with to adhere to certain standards in order to get your love. Somebody talk to me up in here. If you're my best friend, I'm expecting trust. I'm expecting loyalty. I'm expecting commitment. I'm expecting some level of devotion. Listen, when I need you, I expect you to be there. I expect you not to talk about me. I expect you not to let other people talk about me. And if you do hear them talking about me, I expect you to have my back. Don't tell me what they said about me. Tell me what you did to defend me. Come on now, come on now, y'all. I'm talking good out there. Y'all know how, Lord Jesus. Y'all know how y'all ladies, they said what? But let me tell you what I said, girl. I'm telling you, we got to have standards. So if we have standards for each other, where do you think that mindset came from? Where do you think your mindset of morality came from? There are people, a daughter that don't even believe in Jesus Christ, but they have a level of standard and morality. Where do you think that came from? It came from God. It came from God. And so now we hasten on. Am I, am I making sense out there, family? Y'all nod your heads at me. Amen. We head over now. And Jesus is speaking, or the angel of the Lord is speaking, Brandon. And he gives them information. And we go down. Uh, we go back to Judges, the second chapter. Y'all excuse some of the errors in there. I apologize. Uh, Judges 2. This is, what the, this is what happens after the Lord spoke to the people. Right after the Lord spoke to the people. The sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And serve the Baals. What is important here, whenever you go through the Old Testament, you'll hear references to Baal, Moloch, Ashtaroth. These are all pagan gods out of Canaan, out of Mesopotamia, out of the Mesopotamian area, parts of Egypt, into Africa. And you'll see these foreign gods. And God is telling you, I want you to be different and separated. But what happened if you go back to the time of Balaam and Balak, y'all, I'm giving you a history lesson. I hope y'all eating this up because I'm going somewhere don't go to sleep on me during the time of Balaam and Balak the children of Israel were conquering so the king didn't want the children to win so he went and got someone that was able to hear from a spirit now what's ironic here is the prophet some call him a prophet was able to see God and hear from God and God told him what to do but now because money drove him he opened up himself to be able to get money in order to curse God's children but God appeared to the prophet and said listen who I've blessed you can't curse there's a blues clues of blessing in there for you anybody that's going through anything whatever God has placed on your life for blessing no devil can take it away from you the point in that story is Israel lost not because God left them but because they chose something different than what God had and whenever you choose outside of God you reap what the devil of this world has for you so it's not that the enemy is against you you turned your back on who had better for you so now the prophet is going and doing all of these things and he taught 
the king how to cause the children of Israel how to stumble. They were caught up in sexual immorality and idol worship. The Bible would just call that lust of the flesh. And so they were caught up in these things and they began to turn their back on God. And Suzanne, you begin to see from judges on back on through the entirety of the Old Testament, the children of Israel always had a stumbling block of idol worship. It even got so bad that God called the prophet Hosea and gave the description of being married to the backslider. He told the prophet, go marry a prostitute. Y'all, I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. Go marry a prostitute. Have children with them. Name each and every one of those children a name that reminds them how they have hurt me. And he says, listen, just like you have married the harlot that has run away, a prophet, go back and find that woman and reclaim her and bring her back into your bosom. The Bible says that the prophet's wife went and sold herself for so much and so, but God demanded that the prophet go back and get her and bring her back into to his home what's important to understand God will go to any length for someone that he loves hey, Lord help me and so now when we're going through struggles and problems and you're feeling like God is not there simply because you have issues of life you then have to recall to your mind therefore you have hope great is his faithfulness unto you lord y'all remember that last week from lamentations you have to recall what god has done you have to remember what god has been and you have to remember he is god and he changes not whoever he was yesterday he is today and whatever length he has to go to in order to get you back unto him that's what he's going to do but the problem with the children of israel is they didn't know what better was here is what happened. Here is what happened. Here is what happens. We go now. Here's what happens. Uh, Joshua dies. The Bible says Joshua dies. Joshua dies. And the elders along that saw what God did prior to began to die off Mika. So what happened then is a generation came up that did not know God. I'm going to read some names off to you real quick. Reinhard Bonnke. Billy Graham. Morris Sorello, Gilbert Patterson, most recently J.D. Ellis, countless mothers in the faith, Ronald Brown, R.W. Schambach, countless pastors who have carried the message of holiness within the past 10 years. A lot of these people that held up the standard have died and gone on to be with the Lord. The problem with that is if we don't have sons and daughters who understand the God that they serve, we'll get a generation of people that know God or that have a form of godliness. And so what happens is, as we go through Judges, the children of Israel turn their back on God for Baal. They turn their back on God for Ashtaroth. God always intended for his children to stand out out not be a part of the mix but because the children of Israel put the lust of the flesh ahead of the word of God not realizing God was better for them they chose what the pagan world had and neglected God but here is what I always want to bring to your attention every time they did that the Bible said so God was angry and rose up against them and he allowed the nations that they were supposed to be reigning over to put them into captivity. And when the captivity and the bondage got so bad, God heard their cry and he raised up judges, people to rule over them. Because to understand this historically, the children of Israel were under what was called a theocracy. Meaning God spoke to them and dealt with them specifically. They had priests that carried out certain things that God wanted them to do in order to ensure they stayed holy before him. They had certain rituals, but they were under a theocracy. So at this time, God raises up judges, basically priests or prophets who would go before God on behalf of the people and instruct them because the people were not wise enough to keep the standard by themselves. 
So now people that tell you church is not necessary and pastors are not necessary, we can go back to judges and see after the leader died who had a relationship and after the elders died and elders scripturally are nothing more than pastors. And after they went on, a generation that didn't know God, like the previous generation knew God, they began to spread out and blend in like the people around them. Does that sound like 2020? And God says, you deserve better. I've given you standards. I've given you my word. I've given you insight. Why would you choose a way that leads to death versus sticking it out with me? Lord have mercy. Now, God loves us so much, he looks down more generations. He understands what's going to happen. And so he sends his son down 40 and two generations to be born of a woman. Steps out in flesh, dies on Calvary's cross. But listen, even after all of that sacrifice, he runs into what I call that we see even now the Barabbas generation. The Barabbas generation, Lady Nicole, is the generation that would choose someone that allows them to feel comfortable where they are versus choosing the God that will make you feel uncomfortable and and charge you to be better. Are we a part of the Barabbas generation? We can't want the people that allow us to feel comfortable and make us happy, but there is no change. The Bible says it this way. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? The context here is not just man based on gender, but mankind. What does it profit a person to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What does it matter if you've got more money hand over fist? What does it matter if you've got 50 employees, 100? employees 10 businesses what does it matter if you're out of right relationship with Jehovah and so what happens is the people begin to neglect God they begin to neglect God they turn their back on him they turn their back on him the same God if you notice from about Exodus all the way through anytime God would speak he would say I was the God that brought you out of bondage I was the God that brought you out of bondage with a strong hand and for those of us that think we deserve better in life God deserves better from you There are some words I'm not going to have time to go through all of them today and clearly define. But if you think about the relationship God has with his people, he wants reconciliation through repentance. He wants our our relationship to be reconciled, to be brought back together because sin separates us. We get that in Genesis 3 when man disobeys God and decides to hear the devil catch it now for the lust of the eye and the pride of life. I see what I want even though God says I can't have it. So now if I disobey God by a word, I can be like God. So I can have what I want even though God says I don't need it. How often has that happened? Someone has instructed you through the wisdom and the knowledge of scripture and said, you don't need that. Well, you don't know what I need. Well, I'm giving you the word of God. And the minute you took a bite of that fruit, you realize I should have left it on the tree. But because of that one situation, that one issue, pride of life, lust of the flesh, choosing what the devil says, y'all hear me out there, versus what God has already spoken to you. What has God given you? I don't hear God speak. Stop worrying about hearing some voice out of the clouds. God's word is very clear. It's written. And if you want to know his mind, it's always in the Bible. Because God is eternal, his word is timeless. Even though Genesis may have been written to a situation or or based on what was going on in the conditions now, I've painted a picture of a generation in 2020 that choose what they want over what God says and not realizing God deserves better. You deserve better you deserve a God that hears that loves that is committed to you committed so that he would send his only son to die on Calvary's cross to give you the opportunity to live a life close to him but also when you step out of time into eternity you can spend eternity with him So many people say I'm living in hell right now. Well, if you feel like you're living in hell right now, why would you not want better and die and spend eternity in heaven? I don't want to live in hell naturally and die and live in hell eternally. 
And so this is the picture that the narrative is painting. God is saying, listen, I pull people out unto me to show the nations of the world. If they would just serve me and obey me, they would have better. But it does not come without stipulations and standards. We cannot expect better from God. And we give God the minimum. Think about that. We want God to give us everything that crosses our mind. God, I, ooh, that caused the Lord in the name of Jesus. But we don't have the time to pray for anything beyond anything that's temporal, meaning that it may fade, it may die, it may break down. But what about your relationship with Christ Jesus? Y'all hear me talking. So now we, he wants reconciliation through repentance. Once we're reconciled, he wants salvation. This is who Christ is. He is our salvation. He wants salvation. Elder Brandon, do me a favor. Walk over there and cut that AC down for me, just on my side. He wants salvation. He wants to save you from what could happen eternally. God is looking further than just you being able to get a car or a husband. Oh, y'all quiet out there. Y'all quiet out there because if you don't understand what having a committed relationship with Christ is like, any natural relationship is going to be up and down. He wants to restore you to a fundamentally solid relationship with him. So he sets standards that will keep you in a relationship with him where you don't feel separated despite what you're going through relationship does not falter if you consistently do the things that are necessary to maintain the relationship i would like to submit to you all today people that say they don't feel like god is near or they don't feel like god is anywhere around them or they can't sense him they don't have a consistent and committed relationship with him because the bible says if i lift my eyes up in hell he's there the Bible says, if I take the wings of the morning, he's there. Job, when he was swallowed by the whale and taken down, which was, an, uh, which was giving us a description of what Christ would do in the earth for three days and three nights, God was still there. But how do we maintain that? By cultivating the relationship and realizing God deserves better than just what we feel like we want to give him. You don't get the best out of anybody by giving them the minimum. Y'all hear me out there. Here is the wonderful thing about God, daughter. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us Jesus. Think about this. From Exodus on forward, the children of Israel get delivered. Not only do they get delivered out of bondage, they get delivered out of bondage with wealth. So they leave wealthy people out of bondage. God says, now, not only that, I'm going to I'm going to preserve you in the wilderness. I want to preserve you. I'm not going to let your clothes get too raggedy. I'm not going to let your shoes get too small. If you want meat, I'm going to give you quail. I'm going to create a food called manna. You're thirsty. I'll make water come out of a rock. And what he's doing is displaying his infinite power to them. So there's always a level of trust. Well, why does it, how, how does that work with me? Has there ever been any time in your initial relationship with God, something that you thought about you just thought about it. you didn't even ask for it but God brought it to pass quickly now as your relationship with him got a little older have you noticed those things don't manifest quite like that anymore and it's not because God has changed he wants you to trust him based on what you know about him not just what you can get out of him because if he does that every time you treat him as a genie and not as your God and God I hate to say it this way but y'all don't mind if I give it plain talk do you y'all say go ahead pastor God is not our jump off. We don't go to God just when we need God. I need a money. God, I need a car. God, I need a house. God, I need a wife. God, I need a this. God, I need a that. Well, God is saying, do you just need me? 
Because if you get me, you'll get all of those things. What did he say? Matthew 6 and 33. What is it? Seek first the kingdom of God and what his righteousness. So if we seek him, if we love him, if we stay committed and in consistent relationship, all these things will be added. And so now you don't have to always worry about where am I going to eat? Where am I going to sleep? Listen, if you have relationship and you have responsibility, because within relationship, God is going to teach you responsibility. So you won't have to worry about where you're going to sleep because responsibility came out of relationship will tell you to maintain your credit. That's too practical, right? We see his love. We see his faithfulness, Elder Brandon. He's faithful. He doesn't change. He, he's the same God. And the one time in scripture where I see where God adjusted his word was when Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. Remember that story of Hezekiah the king? And the prophet Isaiah said, come on, get yourself, you, you about to die, get your house in order. And Hezekiah wasn't ready to die. And he turned his face to the wall and reminded God of all that he had done to make God's name great. And before the prophet could leave the palace, he, God spoke to him and turned around and said, go tell him I'm going to add some more years. So even when God changes his mind, he changes his mind in our favor. Remember when the children, when David numbered the children of Israel and it angered God and God said, choose your punishment. And David found the threshing floor and God's hand stayed and no more of the children of Israel were destroyed. Lord have mercy. If you go through the book of Judges, you will see every time the children of Israel got delivered, they obeyed God for a season or two. And then they got caught back up in the things that they never defeated. Can I talk to somebody? This is not even in my notes. Some struggles you consistently are going over and over. Paul called it this way, a thorn in my flesh. But the Bible comes back and says, but my strength is made perfect perfect in your weakness sometimes those consistent struggles those consistent thorns are designed not for you to give in to them but to give in to God the Bible says it this way there's no temptation that is taken man that God has not provided a way of escape and from Exodus through Malachi you see God giving the children of Israel a way of escape he says listen I'm going to bring a people unto me and put my law on their heart he had the insight to know they're not going to keep all 613 so I'm going to give them grace I'm going to give them mercy and we see grace and mercy even in the story of Noah even even though it's not called that at that time, we see the mercy of God. We see the grace of God because he's keeping his word to his people, Lord. This is why you haven't gone down because God's mercy said no, Lord have mercy. This is why we were in the bars. We were in the drug dens. We were in hotel rooms, bedrooms, taking drugs, and we didn't die because God says, I still got a covenant with them. Even if they can't keep covenant, I'm a covenant keeping God. Lord have he, Lord, y'all don't hear me out there. You deserve better. What other God, what other person is going to see you as you are and still say, I'm not slap concerning my promise I don't want anybody to go to hell I want all to come to salvation I'm giving everybody time I'm giving everybody an opportunity I'm giving you preachers after my own heart pastors after my own heart I'm giving you Jesus that died on Calvary's cross you deserve better what do you deserve better than you deserve better than hell he loves you so much he wants you to spend eternity with him he wants you he wants you, but the Bible says in Judges 2 that the children of Israel just couldn't get it right. They kept getting pulled away by everything externally. The world was calling them. Y'all hear me talking. The world was calling them. They wanted to dress like the world. They wanted to sound like the world. They wanted to worship like the world. But guess what? The called out people of God are supposed to be different than the world. I don't get angry when the world, the people, the unregenerated Suzanne, do what they do because they're doing what they're supposed to do. Serve their father, the devil. But those of us that have said we love Christ Jesus. Now we understand it's not by it's by faith we are saved. Amen. A checklist is not going to get you into heaven. But when I give my life to Christ, I want to learn what pleases him to keep him happy because I love him. 
Y'all hear me talking out there. I'm not doing a checklist for the sake of saying, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't cuss. There are plenty of us that drink, smoke, and cuss and preach. I do those things because I love him and I want to please him and I want to stay in relationship with him. This is why Paul says it this way. There is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus because we're in Christ Jesus. His grace and his mercy is afforded to us for those that are not. The wages of sin is death, but this is how good God is. You deserve better, but the gift of God is eternal life. I would like to tell you, church, I have been one of many preachers that have taught y'all wrong. Life is greater than a car that you drive. Don't come to church seeing if the pastor's going to prophesy a house or a car to you. You don't need any individual to prophesy that to you. The Bible gives you the, the guidelines on what's necessary in order to have these things. Honor God. Honor him with your life. Honor him with your increase. And he teaches to be a good steward. All in the book of Proverbs. If you do these things, you can have those things that you desire. And whenever there may be some resistance, then we can get together in prayer and fight that resistance. But I've, some of us have taught you wrong, including me. We don't come to church just to dance because we want a car. You deserve better. You deserve a better gospel than that. The gospel is Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross for you so that you would have an opportunity to spend eternity with him. Somebody say, I deserve better. I'm glad you feel that way. Now let's deal with why God deserves better. Somebody say, offend me, pastor. Oh, all y'all was quiet on that one, but two people. Jesus should be your first priority, not your afterthought. Jesus should be your first priority, not your afterthought. Not the thing, oh yeah, I need to pray. Mm -mm. Oh yeah, I need to read my Bible. No, 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 no. As soon as God's mercy comes and you take that breath and come out of sleep, and you have the consciousness of your mind and thoughts. The first words out of your mouth need to be, thank you, Jesus. Because somebody woke up into eternity. And somebody woke up to eternity without God. The Bible says, and I'm trying to teach you, not in fear, but scripture. The Bible says that hell is expanding daily. Why is that important to understand? That means is making room for the people that's going to abandon God. The Bible says that even the saved are scarcely going to be saved. And when we teach a gospel that puts the importance on houses, cars, and land, and not the responsibility of your love towards God and your commitment and your relationship towards God, we have bastardized the gospel. There's nothing wrong with nice things. Work hard and get them. But those things should not come before your relationship, your commitment, and your consistency to the Lord Jesus Christ. He deserves better. He is not our afterthought. How many of you, like me, uh, can sit up and watch hours of television, but the minute you crack the Bible, you get sleepy? We can go outside and wash our cars, but when it's time to pray, we're tired. Come on, men. We can go do what we want to do that. We believe it's fun right now. There's nothing wrong with doing these things. But where are our priorities? Who gave you the resources to get the car? Who gave you the resources to pay for Netflix? Who gave you the resources to have the television? Your job is your resource. God is your source. The Bible says he has given you the power to get wealth. But within that same chapter, within those same verses, it's not so you can pat yourself on the chest and say, look what I got. It's so that you can say, God is glorified. If you're successful on your job, it ain't got nothing to do with you. What do you do if God takes his favor off of you? Because many of us don't go to work on time. We're not consistent. We're not, we have to do the job. But somehow you still got a raise. Somehow two other people got furloughed and you still getting the check. And you know you've been slacked the past three years. It's called mercy, baby. 
and grace when you don't get what you deserve. We didn't deserve Jesus, but God said I'm going to give it to them anyway. Because if I line their lives up by the 613, throw a stone at them. Ah, Lord, y'all, help me up in here. Is this blessing anybody? Somebody say, teach, pastor. Your devotion, and I'm almost done, guys. Your devotion, and I, I'm not even joking, I'm almost done. Your devotion should match God's commitment. Your devotion to God should match God's commitment to you. Well, I'll never be perfect or we'll die trying. Can I say that again? I'll never be perfect, die trying. Die trying to please him. Don't tell me we don't know what to do. When we were in the world and we wanted that girl, we did whatever we needed to do to get her. We wanted that dude, we did whatever we needed to do to get him. We needed that money or how they say it now, you chasing the bag, you do whatever you need to do to get the bag. So don't tell me we don't know how, what it is to be committed to something until we achieve a certain level of success. And the success you're looking for is a well-rounded, cultivated relationship with Christ Jesus that you don't have to necessarily talk about, but the world can see. If you can still have a walk into a den of demons and they don't get look at you sideways and your relationship ain't right yet. You should be able at some point to walk into a dinner places because guess what? I got to work. I got I got a job. I got an, I'm by vocational full time outside, full time inside. When I step on the scene, I expect a certain amount of resistance simply because of who I am. I don't have to go on the job and tell people I'm a pastor. They ask. Are you a preacher? I'm like, dog. If I wanted to show out, they see it on me. You talk like a, are you a preacher? Yeah. You pastor? Yeah. They see it on you. And you don't have to carry a title. You don't have to walk around with the Bible. Should be thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. And when his word is in you, it's going to come through you. Whatever you consume, you will produce. So if you're still consuming anything that's anti-Christ, don't be rebuking the devil if you're willingly eating it. You're producing what you're eating. I'm, have a pro I'm having problems, Pastor, fighting the enemy. He's always against me. Okay, let's look at your, let's look at, let's, let's take a checklist. What does your prayer life look like? What, is the, what does your fasting life look like? What does your Bible reading time look like? What does your book list read like? Uh, look like, are you reading and doing things that are necessary to pull you out of where you are? Or Mika, are we waiting simply for someone to grab us and take us to where we belong? It doesn't work that way. You've got a road map. This is, if I'm painting the picture correctly, why God assigned the fivefold apostles, prophets, teachers, preachers, pastors. They're not in order, but he assigned the fivefold so the body would have what they needed. On the fivefold, the pastor is a ring finger and he's attached to the heart of God. God says, I'm going to give you shepherds after my own heart that are going to feed you after my mind and after my wisdom. This is why it is important when the children of Israel got out of relationship, they started consuming consuming pagan food and pagan food turned them against their God pagan food was not just necessarily pork it was doing the things that God had forbidden that God said this is not good for you so now he's appointing judges to instruct them but every time the judge would die they would fall out of relationship they wouldn't pay attention and so now isn't that a generation that we have now I don't need a leader I can get God for myself well according to the book of judges when it was under theocracy and they had a hand of God on them they couldn't do it unless there was somebody instructing them teaching them and pointing them back to God so don't tell me I am the church if you are the church why are you still in sin you can't be the church by yourself you are not an assembly <sighs> y'all that must be good to somebody your desire to please God should override the desire to please yourself Think about it this way, Jamar. If what I want is more important than what God says, who's the God? Cars can be our God. Jobs can be our God. They can become our bales. They can become our Ashtaroths. Listen, telephones are Moloch. 
I want you to go back about 10 minutes when I was teaching to you. Moloch was the god that the pagan people sacrificed their children to. These cell phones have become the Moloch to our children. Don't want to be bothered? Put on your cell phone. And within those cell phones, they get into YouTube. And now we have a generation of 10 and 12 listening to uh, Cardi B. Some of us grew up fast, but we didn't grow up until we were 16. Now these kids are growing up at 10, listening and watching things that we had to get an adult to get us into. And you know how they're getting it? Because we've allowed the world to tell the church how we should raise our children. When the Bible says raise them under the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Can't nobody see y'all on camera, all right? They can only see me. By show of hands, how many of you, if you could go back to in time to certain things you got early, if you could tell the younger you not to do it, how many of you would go back in time and, and not do it? So why now do we allow the secular world to tell the called out body how we're supposed to raise our children? Just get that child a phone and leave him alone. You don't, you know what you were thinking about when you were 14. You just didn't have quick access to it. Now they can go to YouTube and find whatever they want. They deserve better. They deserve to be taught of a God that we know about, a God of standards, a God of principles, a God that sent his son to die for them. But they also need to understand that God deserves better. There is no other God but Jehovah and his son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for our sins. Somebody say amen. amen. If God can give us Jesus, we can at least show him consistent gratitude. God can give us Jesus. We can at least show him consistent gratitude. I taught last week, uh, out of, I think it was last week, out of Lamentations. Because of his mercies, we are not consumed. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Where is your gratitude? I'm going through. Is he keeping your mind? I'm going through. Is he keeping your family? I'm going through. Can you still make you some pancakes if you want them? I'm going through. Can you realize that you're going through? Do you have the mental capacity to realize, yeah, I'm going through, but I'm still living it. There are people right now that thought, I think I've said this before, in February, March, didn't know how they were going to make it. Well, the year is almost over and you're still here. You're still eating. You still got gas in your car. Your light bill still paid. Your children are all right. They, listen, come on here. People shopping right now like they got a second stimulus check. God is good. Amen. So if he can give us his son, why can't we give him consistent gratitude, Mika? The problem becomes we dwell so much on what we're going through that we don't realize that God is still there while we're going through it. The one word I did go over that I'm going to hit probably every Sunday is sovereign. It's sovereign. God super rules. He rules outside of time. He rules in eternity. There's nothing happening that he's not aware of. God can do as he wills. But the only thing God can't do is contradict his character. So God can't lie. God can't take away your free will. But God can let you know I'm always with you. Be of courage. Be of good cheer. I won't leave you nor will I forsake you. God gives us examples from Genesis to Revelation of his faithfulness and his commitment to us. But false gospel teaching tells you you should never go through. That's a lie. Job said it this way. Man of a woman is of a few days. And those days are filled with trouble. Now we know every day ain't, you know, ain't going to be sunny. But guess what? It's the sun is with us. To keep you, to protect you, to get you through it. Listen, I'm dealing with so many people right now at work and, and throughout their losing family members. People are going on to be with the Lord and we're taking it so hard and all of this. And I understand it because you know what? I lost my dad and I still think about him sometimes. But guess what? He served his time. He lived his purpose. My job is to look what God has done. Look how God used my daddy to get me to where I am. Look how God has done this. Look how God has done that. And find the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
that is our responsibility. I would have fainted if I failed to see. That means you take the responsibility on seeking for good. I'm so tired of people posting and sharing so much wickedness. I don't need help seeing the bad. Show me something good. 200,000 people died. 800,000 people died less this year than last year. Show me something good. Let me know that God is still in charge. Tell me. The, 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 yeah, I know the end is the end is I'm going to win. But even in the midst of suffering, God is still good. God is still good. Look over to my left. I see my daughter Shay. And she said, Pastor, I want a certain job and certain, certain things. And God did it for her. God is still good. God is still good. Look at Suzanne up and down the road, up and down the road, up and down the road. No, she was tired. Up and down the road. But God is still good. Keeps us safely. So many other things I could call out about each and every one of you, including myself. But we've got to know we deserve better. But so does God. What about those times you were tired behind the steering wheel and you blanked out for a couple seconds, but you woke up before your car swerved? Oh, I know what I see. That's the mercy of God. He deserves our hallelujah. You woke up, how did I get in this lane? Oh, I know I'm talking, I see it in my eye. How did I get in this lane? God is still good. Driving down, listen here. God deserves better. He deserves a hallelujah. He deserves a thank you, Jesus. He deserves all of it. Listen, y'all. Listen, pastor may have conditioned you wrong early on with organ and drums and keyboards and all of this other stuff, but those things are not there when God is keeping you in the car, when God is keeping you in your home, when God kept you in the nightclub, when God kept you in the street, when God kept your children. Nobody has to hit an instrument for me to have a spirit of gratitude and take Tell God, thank you. Am I so special that he kept me? Have you ever asked yourself that? I'm in a head-on, could I've been in a head-on collision that other people would have died from, but God kept little on me. Lord, have mercy. God deserves better, church, than our leftovers. God deserves better than secondary consideration. He should be our priority and our first. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus, in this place. He deserves better. I'm almost done. I promise you I'm almost done. I can't carry this over to second Sunday. When we neglect what God requests, listen to this. When we neglect what God requests, you accept what the devil provides. That one hit your daughter. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate a good amen. When we accept what the devil requests, what God requests, excuse me, we accept what the devil provides. Because if you don't want what God wants, somebody's going to come with something else. I want us to be very wise about this. The devil don't got no old trick, no new tricks. He has no new tricks, Mika. He's going to come to that area where there's a thorn in your flesh. He's going to slip right in when you've been disobedient. There are times, y'all, can I just talk to y'all for a minute? I can't tell, and I probably told this story 15, 20 times in over six years. Jordan, I can count the times on my hands that I have audibly, like I hear this right here, that I've audibly heard God speak, like just talk to me. One of the times I can recall, he told me not to do something to keep me out of danger. Another time he visited me in the closet and began to talk to me about some stuff I wasn't doing that I had to come back and, and talk to the church about. I can count on my hands the times that I've heard him speak to me audibly. What's the point? We still have to know what he expects even if he doesn't speak audibly. And the only way you get that is through understanding his word. He's always there. But there's so many things competing, listen to you all, for our attention. 
This is why it's easy to watch TV and get sleepy when you read the word. Because when you try to prioritize the Lord, or if you disobey the Lord, the enemy is going to slip right in. Just going to sleep. You can wake up in the morning and read. You know you ain't getting up 6 o'clock. Some of y'all struggle to get up by 7. Say amen. That's not thrown off. I have to have two alarms. It's what it is. You know if you if the Lord has told you every day by 8 a.m. by 8 p.m. read read the word and pray, you know by nine o'clock some of y'all asleep as soon as your head hit the pillow. So the Lord is instructing you to give me what's due me to prepare you and equip to keep the relationship going. When you break that cycle, you fall out of fellowship. Once you fall out of fellowship, I hear this so often, I don't feel like God is near me. Because you've accepted what the devil provided. And what the devil provided may have been Netflix. What the devil may have provided, Hulu. What the devil may have provided is anything that takes your attention away from God. And God isn't requiring that. Just live for me. Just live for me. Jobs require eight hours a day. You mean to tell me we can't find 30 minutes a day for God in prayer and scripture? And we can break that up in increments. You mean to tell me, I'm coming now. Thank y'all. Y'all hear my heart. You mean to tell me we can't find time once a week to come out or tune in to hear the word of the Lord for our life? Let's be honest. We live in a time where we're more busy than we think we are. Between iPhones, iPads, Androids, we're more connected. So things are going for our attention. So we feel like we have less time than we really do. But you're not that busy. You're just preoccupied with a whole lot of stuff. And God is not your priority. I was up here 30 minutes ago with my watch on and somebody was texting me. I had to take it off. You know I'm preaching. What you texting me for? Gonna have to deal with it when I get off, when I finish church. But if God is the priority, you make everything else secondary. Am I blessing y'all? I promise we're almost done. Cease making God a priority only when you're in trouble. I've had to instill this, daughter, and it's, sometimes it can come across hard. I, at this point, I don't want to hear from nobody talking about, Pastor, what's the word of the Lord, and I ain't seen or heard from you in 90 days. And I'm not God, I'm not Jesus, I'm not the Holy Spirit. Because most times, can I be honest? Can I teach you? God deserves better. Anything God gives to me, if you had already been in relationship with him, I'm only going to tell you what he's already said to your heart. If you were really listening. And if it's contrary, either I heard God, misheard God, or you're walking in disobedience. God deserves better than our leftovers. He must be priority. We question God's love when we reap what we sow, but we expect him to deliver us when we neglected him. And y'all want to know what's awesome about God? He comes through anyway. That's why the Bible teaches, I'd rather be in the hands of an angry God than any one of y'all. Think about that. Because if we lose our temple, we may not have any mercy. But when we call on the name of Jesus, say, Jesus, have mercy on me. I, listen, Lord, I know I may, but Lord, you know I've been wrestling with this one. It got me, Lord, help me. You may have to go through it, but have you ever wondered why you're going through what you deserve, how you just, you were able to go through with the peace? I'm going to be all right. I'm going to come out on the other side of this all right. That's the kind of God that we serve. This is why he deserves better. Are you giving Jesus your best or what you have left? Are you giving him your best or what you have left? Before I get to this, and that's my closing, that's how you know I'm closing, I just want to encourage you. I teach this, I do a uh, discipleship class once a week. And one of the things we've learned is we don't have to compare our relationship to anybody else's. When you hear pastor talk about I get up at 2.30 in the morning to pray or 3 don't let that condemn you or convict you. Just get up and pray. I pray from 2.30 in the morning to 5.30. I, I can't pray through. And nobody's asking for you to. What Jesus wants is you to build a relationship with him. 
If that's seven o'clock in the morning, if that's five minutes at, in the morning when you get up, five minutes at lunch and five minutes before you go to bed, he deserves better. Don't feel like, well, all I can get through is Psalms 23, Psalms. Well, at least you're getting a chapter a day. Break it up until it becomes a habit and you form that relationship. And guess what? That one Psalm that you were taught 20 years ago, because you're committed to reading it, you will begin to get insight to a side of God that you never knew because you committed your time to him. You can't get the best given your minimum. What we have done, Elder Brandon, what we have done, Sister Suzanne, is created a spirit of entitlement without work. And that breeds laziness. And so when we preach a gospel that says God is not about a house called land and that is about your salvation. For some, it may sound weird, but that's the, the gospel is not about you. It's about Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. The world doesn't mind us saying God and all of that other stuff, but it's a, the gospel is about Christ Jesus and what he did for you and how he loves you and how he died for you and how he shed his blood for you and how his own people rejected him and chose Barabbas, but he still loved you enough to go to Calvary's cross. He says, listen, you can't take me. I take my life. I give it willingly. He died. Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost. He said, I'm willing to die die he left his kingdom put on flesh to die get spat on get whipped get tortured be nailed to a cross be mocked put on a crown of thorns stop dying asked his father to forgive all of them and then went to be with the lord catch it now even after forgiving another one on the cross and said today you're gonna be with me in paradise that's the kind of god you serve he's bigger than a car He's bigger than your job. He's bigger than a house. Where are you going to spend eternity? We owe him more than what we've been giving him. We want to call on him now because of a pandemic. Why weren't we calling on him 10 years ago? We want to call on him now because of everything that's going on in the nation. Why weren't we calling on him last year? We forgot that he deserved better. If you've ever said this to the Lord, Lord, I would, but I'm tired. Shame on you. Because we serve a God that never slumbers nor sleeps. I know Jesus said the flesh is willing. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But we can at least try. We can try. We can try. I'll never be perfect. Die trying to please the Lord. God has given us his best through his son. Are you giving him your best with your life? I can't answer that question for you, only you can. What can you give to him from your life that he deserves? He deserves your praise. He deserves your adoration. He deserves your commitment. He deserves your consistency. This is bigger than just coming to a, a, a church or on Sunday morning. It's about building a relationship and showing your gratitude to him, not to a man. When he becomes the priority and the center of your life, you'll never want to neglect him. And the minute you do, you like, oh, Lord, I forgot to talk to the Lord this morning. Oh, Lord, I forgot to give you time. We teach so often. How to be better husbands, how to be better wives, how to be leaders. But we forgot to tell you how to serve God. Because you can't be a good wife if you don't know how to serve the Lord. You can't be a good husband if you don't know how to serve the Lord. You can't be a good leader if you haven't mastered or seen what Jesus did. He said the greatest leader is the servant of all. And then he kneeled down, Mika, and he washed feet. So you can't be a leader if you can't serve, and you won't know that if there's no relationship. Y'all talk to me. We've neglected him so. We've taught so much stuff erroneously because it sounds good, Mallory. It makes us feel good. But the joy should come from you know where you want to spend eternity. Y'all want to hear something crazy? Somebody may say, Pastor, that's not true. You may catch a cold. You may get a headache. You may have a car accident. These things may happen. 
doesn't mean God isn't with you. Doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. We live in the flesh. And the flesh is subject to natural issues. Now there's a difference if you're not doing the things that you need to do to take care of yourself. But don't judge your relationship with God simply by the car that you drive or the fact that you never go through. I know God is with me because I never have a problem. Nah, maybe you're sleeping with the devil. He ain't got to bother you if he already got you. He comfortable with you. He know you there. He know you right there in the bed. There she is. She ain't going nowhere. But what does your relationship look like with Christ Jesus on a daily basis? First relationship when I was a kid, we sent a letter. You like me? Yes, no, maybe so. Get us snacks. Hold a hand. Had a little checklist. We were, we were serious about that thing. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Your first little girlfriend, your first little boyfriend. We were serious about that thing. We come into a relationship with God, and we don't have the time for him. Somebody say, Lord, you deserve better. Rest on your feet. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for everything that you've done. But we stand here today knowing that you deserve better. You deserve our praise. You deserve our adoration. God, you're greater than a car. You're greater than a house. You're greater than money. You're greater. All these things belong to you anyway. But Lord, our sole relationship, our sole purpose is to come into the understanding of what you came for. For us. To redeem us. To reconcile us. To save us. So that we could spend eternity with you. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, if we've neglected you, if We've not given you our best. We repent right now in the name of Jesus because you deserve better. You deserve better, Lord, than being our afterthought. You deserve better than being something we think about later. You deserve better than the only time we come to you is when there's a problem. Lord, there's so many things that you did just yesterday that we're not even aware of that you did to keep us and protect us. God, so for that, we just need to tell you thank you every chance we get. Heavenly Father, for those of us that have misunderstood or mistaught the gospel we repent we renounce false doctrine we renounce false understanding we renounce anything that makes us more important than you you are the priority you are the center you are the first you are the last you are everything god you deserve more Heavenly Father, we thank you because your word says there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So God, we don't pick up the spirit of condemnation, but we thank you for your Holy Ghost conviction. Even me, Lord, help me to be better. Help me to think better. Help me to talk better. Help me to respond better. Help me to live for you, God, in every area of my life. God, help us to live for you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for hearing our plea. Lord, we thank you for hearing our cry. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you would, while you're there, I'm going to go and offer the prayer of salvation. Just take a moment and worship him. And just pay me no mind, because I'm assuming all of y'all are in here saved. If not, pray this prayer along with me. Listen, if you're out there watching or even in the sanctuary right now, and you've heard this message now or maybe on the replay, and you don't know Jesus, I want you to know he died for you. You are so awesome to him that he died for you. He suffered for you. He wants you to come into relationship with him. Coming into relationship with Jesus does not mean you won't have trials, you won't have struggles, you won't have problems. It just means you have a God that will wrap his arms around you and keep you in the midst of it. He'll keep your mind knowing that on the other side, all things work together for your good. And whatever you're going through, he's always been there. He was there yesterday. He was there last week. He'll be there tomorrow. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He wants you. He wants to be a part of your life. If you have been saved and you turned your back on him, the Bible says he's married to the backslider. He will go to the greatest extent to get to you. Those of you that are watching that may not be saved, if we have mistaught the gospel, making you think it's about cars, houses, money. Nah, it's not about that. It's about Jesus Christ and him being crucified. 
You don't need Jesus to get a car. You go get one. But you need him for access into eternity. Because all of us are going to go. But who are you going to spend it with? And if you want to give your life to Christ, I want to pray this prayer with you. Just repeat after me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, you're my savior. You're my king. I renounce everything else that I made my God. Lord Jesus, you're the only way. I accept you. Please accept me. Please love me and teach me how to love you. You're my God and I'm your child. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. You've got a place that you're going to spend eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you are backslidden and you prayed that prayer, welcome back to the family family we're so glad to have you listen if you gave your life to christ or you came out of ba a backslidden condition comment below and let us know or send us an inbox so we can pray with you and send you some material on what steps you need to take next amen to my family in the worship center i love y'all so much i pray that this message blessed you and you leave out of here encouraged with a better understanding of why you deserve better and why god deserves better daughter there's so much better ahead for you just tie a knot and hang on don't you give up don't you go I don't need I saw you the other time you were in here and I couldn't open my mouth to you but this Sunday I can I want you to tie a knot and hold on to the promise of the Lord for your life under that mask you don't have to yell it you don't have to scream it just begin to say things have gotten better today Believe the word of the Lord for your life. Just come on through it. I rebuke loneliness. I rebuke all of that stuff. I'm in it by myself. No, you're not. Christ is with you. Oh, glory. Strength for everybody else. But I pray that God give you the strength to get through whatever it is that's trying to hold you back. Because I want to tell you above your head are written these words. Victory in Jesus name. We'll look to the Lord to be dismissed. And I want, if I didn't tell y'all enough, I want you to know how much I love you guys. How much we pray, Lady Nicole, and I pray for you guys. Come on down, Ellen. How much we pray for you guys. How much, y'all, she didn't put on her tights today, so she's a little worried about her legs. But I like legs. Come on over right here. Amen. How much we pray for you. How much we thank God for you. How glad we are to see you all today. How much it means to us when we see you online. It means the world to us. And I pray that this word really blessed you. I pray that this word really blessed you. Amen. So we're going to look to the Lord to be dismissed. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the day of his coming. Be the only wise God, both glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. I speak blessing upon you, your family, your loved ones, and I pray that everything that you're believing God for that has been held up be released. I pray that the testimonies will begin to roll in. I begin, I pray that whatever the enemy, the enemy against your future has tried to do, it be stopped right now in Jesus' name. Rest come your way, peace come your way, joy return to your home, hope come to your mind, finances be released, everything that you're believing God for right now, we decree and declare that within the minute, you'll begin to sense it, see it, and have it in the natural. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and peace abide. We love y'all. Take the Lord along with you everywhere you go. Don't forget the YouTube stream. Jamal, good to see you. Leslie, good to see you, daughter. Love you. Mallory, love you, daughter. Suzanne, love you. Shay, love you. I got something for you. Wow, y'all. Ellen, would you come in for a second?